Uh, if you've got a Bible with you this morning, go ahead and open to Matthew 28. I know I said we were taking a break from Matthew, but we're kind of skipping to the end of it uh, for a week here this morning. Uh, last week, we started a little two-part series called Vision Check. We're taking two weeks off from our study through Matthew that we've been doing to look at why we do what we do. Uh, and so we're refocusing, we're recentering as we're getting ready for, you know, fall to get here, like next month, is insane, uh, taking some time to sort of reorient ourselves and get focused. And so what we also did was we rolled out our new church mission statement last week, adore Jesus, make disciples. Simple, to the point, I think that's something that will help us orient that we can get centered and focused around helps us think critically about what we do here uh what do we do here at lakeside well we adore jesus and make disciples that's what we do uh and so at some point we're gonna plaster that everywhere you won't be able to escape it so it will get drilled in um Last week, we talked about the first half of that, the adore Jesus part, that worship is when you give worth or value to something. It's worth-ship. That's actually where the word comes from. Uh, and so worship always begins with God. It's a response to him. Uh, it's always with God's great mercy in mind, with what he's done, with who he is, that we bring worship to him. Uh, that's something we do as a church. That's something we do as individuals when we leave here. The, when we're here, the singing, the preaching, the giving, the serving, those are all facets of worship, what it looks like here on a Sunday morning. Then when we leave, we're actually called to be worshipful in every area of our lives, that anything and everything we do could and should be worshipped. And so this week, we're going to tackle the second half of that statement, the making disciples. And for that, the best place to go is this passage at the end of Matthew. I couldn't escape it. This is the last instruction that Jesus gives his disciples in Matthew's gospel. This is how Matthew ends the book, puts a cap on it. So spoilers ahead for what we'll cover a few months from now. Uh, it's a famous, important passage of Scripture. It's a commission. And it's a pretty great one, right? Al got it. Right. Well, we're going to take a look at that and talk about what it means and what it means for us. In Matthew 28, verse 18, this is what he writes. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the very end of the age. And so, there's, right there, I mean, you have Jesus tells us, make disciples. Like, okay, cool. So that's our mission here at Lakeside. But he doesn't just leave it at that. He gives sort of two sub-commands under that, baptize them, teach them. And I think that's an interesting way to think about what it means to make disciples, and so that's how we're going to break it up here this morning. And so let's talk about the first one, the baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I look at that, and I see evangelism here. I mean, after all, what is baptism? Baptism is the outward expression of inward repentance. Let's define that down further. So Jesus, John the Baptist, the apostles, what they're all in their preaching are calling people to repent. Well, what does it mean to repent? Well, repentance is two things. Change your mind, change your life. Change your mind, change your life. That's what it means to repent. When you repent, you change your mind about God. You make a commitment to Him. You accept this gift that He's given us. You put your faith in Him. Faith is another word for confidence. You put your trust and your confidence in Jesus to save you, that you're acknowledging that you can't do it yourself, that you can't get there on your own. And so you put your trust in Jesus, that he was the Son of God, that he was risen from the dead, and that he paid the price for our sins. And so that's the first part. That's the change your mind. But then the second part is the change your life. It's that you do your best to follow the commands of Jesus. You try to live the way that he lived, that he's called us 
to live. And you won't do it perfectly. You'll struggle with many, many things. But your change of heart will stoke this desire in you to live a life that pleases God. And so I often use my relationship with Adrian as an example of this, a way to explain this. There's little things that I do, though given my health here lately, far fewer than I used to. Uh, but they're the, I don't do them to be her husband. I already am her husband. Whether she likes it or not, she's stuck with me, right? Uh, and so I do the things out of love for her because they're nice to do for her. I'm not doing them out of obligation. I'm doing them because I know they'll make her happy. And so it's kind of the same way with God, that we're already accepted, that when we put our trust, we put our faith in Jesus, we're in. And so I'm not doing the things that I do to try to earn that. Can't earn it. It's already mine. It's done. But I'm doing them because I love them and because I want to live a life that honors the Lord. And so when you've made that commitment, when you've done that repentance, baptism is the way that that's first expressed. You see it all throughout the New Testament. It's this outward sign that something has happened inside. And so we have this baptism service coming up next Sunday. There's still time to be a part of it. Shoot us a line this week. We'll talk and, uh, and we'll get you set up. It's something that Jesus both models and commands. We talked earlier in the year, Jesus himself gets baptized. And then he tells his disciples, hey, do that for everybody else too. And so you're never too old. We've baptized people that are kids, old adults, young adults, all over the place. So it doesn't matter who you are. If it's something that you haven't done, you've made the commitment, but you've never followed the Lord in that step of baptism, I'd encourage you to do it. And so when Jesus says to baptize here, he's talking about making new believers. It's noteworthy that Jesus says, make disciples. He doesn't say, find disciples. He doesn't say discover disciples. He says make disciples. Create them from the ground up. This is the command that he gives to every believer. Most people think that he's not just talking to the 11 here. He's talking to a large group of people. And he's telling all of them, hey, go make more of you. Every single one of you, just keep it going. And so as a church, there are some ways that we do this. Well, every Sunday, we talk about the gospel. I try to weave in every week what the gospel is and how to respond to that. I don't always succeed, but it's something that I try to do. People need to hear it. How can they hear it if I don't say it? Uh, another thing that we do as a church is we support missionaries and church planners around the world that are taking the gospel to places that we can't go. Not everyone is called to go everywhere, but we give our money, our prayer, our resources to those who are. We also do serve activities every month. Uh, and what that does is it beats that constant drum of missions and service here at Lakeside, that it's always happening, that we're always witnesses out in our community. But Jesus doesn't tell the disciples, hey, set up churches and systems that create disciples. He tells them personally to make disciples. So this is a responsibility that's not just on us as a church, it's on every one of us as individuals. We're all called to do this. Every single one of us should be sharing our faith, should be inviting people to church. Uh, we're going to have some invites, invite cards coming hopefully by next Sunday that'll be, make that a lot easier for you. That It'll just be this little business card size card that'll have Lakeside's info on it. If you want to invite someone to church, you can just give them that card. Like, hey, be great if you can. Here you go. And that's all you got to do. Try to make it easy. I get it. I get it. Sometimes it's a little daunting. That's something everybody could do and everybody should. And so what this means is that we have to be vocal about our faith. We have to be willing to share it with other people. I don't necessarily mean witnessing in the traditional sense. If you've been in church a long time, that word might have a lot of baggage for you. You might think about that and that might conjure up all sorts of bad memories or things like that. Uh, maybe you've seen things that have rubbed you the wrong way. I know I have as well. I hear the word tracked and I get a little muscle twitch or something, you know. But we all have relationships with coworkers, with friends, with neighbors, 
what if we just had spiritual conversations with the people we're already in relationships with? And like, what if we got to know our neighbors, our coworkers, or people around us? What if we got to know people and really invested in them? And then when the door was open and the Holy Spirit was leading us, we just asked them about God and had a conversation. At some point, we have to express our faith. There's a quote that people throw out all the time. It says, preach the gospel when necessary. Or, preach the gospel at all times when necessary. Use words. Now, this is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, there's two problems with it. One, there's absolutely no proof that he ever said that. <laughs> we can't find it, any of his writings, any of his correspondence. It's just not there. He never said this. Uh, secondly, when would it ever not be necessary? What are you going to do, interpretive dance? Like, <laughs> It's verbal. You're going to have to open your mouth at some point. It's made of words. How are you going to communicate it without words? We've all got to be able to express our faith in Jesus. And I understand that's intimidating and that's scary for some folks, and we're planning on doing some training coming up down the road that will help us out with that to be able to, uh, just some tools to make that easier. But it's something that we're all called to do. But this is what's so great, is that we're only responsible for being faithful. Like, did you know that? Like, we can't save anyone. We're not responsible for that. Listen to, this is how Paul describes his role in this process. Mind you, this is Paul. This is like super duper, super duper Apostle Paul. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. He's like, who's, who's, who am I? Who's Apollos? We're just dudes, right? <laughs> it's kind of the point Paul's making here. Like, we're just doing our small part. He may, likens it to gardening. Right? Something I understand on a conceptual level, in practice, not very good at. But it's like, well, I, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but it's God that makes it grow. So Paul plants the seed, he lays out the gospel for the Corinthians. He tells it to them, that's his whole responsibility. He's not responsible for that seed then growing and turning into a plant. He can't be on the hook for that. He's just responsible for planting the seed. And then Apollos comes after, and he expresses the gospel again to him, and it sort of waters what Paul's already laid down. Apollos isn't responsible for it becoming a plant. He's just there to bring the water. It's God who gives the growth. He's the one that turns seeds into plants. The Holy Spirit draws people to himself. The Holy Spirit draws people to cross that line. And so I see something like this, and I think, man, pressure's off, right? Right? Because all I'm called to do then is represent Jesus faithfully, both in my actions, but also in my words. From there, it's not my responsibility. There's no burden on my part to see other people actually take it to heart and run with it. All I'm called to do is be faithful. All you're called to do is be faithful. And so Jesus commands baptisms because he wants his disciples to be instrumental in producing more people that follow Jesus. So that's the first part. The second part here is he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. When Jesus says make, he doesn't mean just like set it up and then walk away from it and forget about it. He is talking about a process. Making a disciple is a lifelong process. It's not something you ever stop doing. It's kind of like being a parent. Like, you're always still a parent. It's not, it's not when your kid turns 18, you're just, he's just some dude now. Like, he's still your kid, right? You're still a parent, and you're still going to be teaching them for the rest of your life. And so disciples are the same way. It's a lifelong process. I am still in process. I have not arrived yet. That, there's still a lot for me to learn. There's still a lot of ways for me to grow. And that's true of every single one of us in here. I don't care how old you are. <laughs> you're not finished yet. He's still working on you. He's still perfecting you. You still have things 
to learn. And so making disciples isn't about like, okay, well, we got these people to pray a prayer, check a box, and then we're done here. No, it's about also growing them along the way. And so disciples, they're learners. That's what it means. The image that should come to mind when you think disciple are like students sitting around a teacher. That's what disciple means. They're learners, and they're lifelong learners at that. But Jesus doesn't just want them to accumulate knowledge for knowledge's sake. He says what? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So it's not just learning to know stuff. It's learning to do something with the stuff that you know. It's learning for obedience. It's learning to follow. When I was in college, there were some classes that I paid attention in. There were some classes that I did not pay attention in whatsoever. Uh, my Bible classes, my counseling classes, ministry classes, theology, all that, I was all over them. Did all the work, did all the reading, got pretty good grades in most of them. I wanted to get as much out of those classes as I possibly could. I took uh, Foundations of Biblical Preaching with Dr. Ron Hall, despite many people telling me not to. The reason why people were telling me not to take this class with him is because his class was hard. He had written his own book for the class, which all of the other teachers then used, by the way, uh, and his tests were brutal. His requirements for the little short sermons that we gave in class were pretty steep. He wanted over 30 pages of research for every five to ten minute sermon that we gave. And those were the reasons that I took the class with him. Because I wanted to grow and learn as much as I possibly could, because I was going to have to do this. If that meant a grade that wasn't quite what I wanted it to be, like, who cares? It's not like I was going to apply to some church and they were going to be like, well, we really like you, but your GPA, it was kind of like, it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so if I recall, I got A's on the sermons and B's and C's on the tests, because they were hard. <laughs> And that's despite me being a pretty good test taker. So it was a tough class. There were other classes, though, that I barely even remember. I took geology at some point in my junior year. I remember none of it. Like, nothing. I remember the room that we met in. <laughs> I remember that I was in there with my friend Amanda, and we found out around the same time that we were both going to be interning at the church in D.C. that we went to. Uh, that's about it. That, I mean, I honestly don't even remember going to class all that often. Uh, no offense to any professional or amateur geologist in our midst this morning, I just did not care at all. Uh, and it's sad. I mean, the professor's really a great guy, too. He actually used to work for a company where he was designing plants at the molecular level, uh, which is like some really trippy stuff to like, talk to him about. That wasn't what the class was about, so I did not care at all. See, because the difference for me was that there wasn't anything to do with geology. I wasn't going to use that. It's not like I was going to go do campus ministry at Penn State or something like that. That's the best geology program in the country, which you didn't know because no one cares about geology. <laughs> But I could put theology to use. I could put preaching to use. I could put geology was in one ear and out the other. And so the kinds of teachers, the kinds of disciples that Jesus is looking for are more like the former than the latter. He wants disciples that aren't just squirreling away information. He wants disciples that are putting it to use, that are looking for ways to live, not just nice things to think about. And so he wants teachers that can get excited and transfer that to someone else. He wants disciples that are eager not just to learn, but to do. And so this shapes the way that we do things here on Sunday morning. It, the music that we sing teaches. It teaches theology. It teaches scripture. It helps us remember the things of God. We just sang how deep the Father's love for us. And as we're singing it, we're learning that. We're getting that into our spirit. So when we leave here, we try to live in light of that, that God loves us so deeply. Our boasting should be in what? Well, it should be in Him, in Him alone, and what He's done. And then obviously the messages are a part of the way that we teach here. It teaches commands and application. That's the point. 
And so we want to be a church that unchurched people feel welcome in, but we're also going to use the message time to help disciples grow in their faith as well. The idea is sort of for everyone to take a step. I stole this from somebody else, but it's great stuff. That like it's maybe somebody's at a two, like well, what could we get them to a three with here in this message? And if someone else is at a 50, like how do we get them to 51? And sort of thinking about that. And so that gets reflected in the way that I preach and teach up here and what I preach and teach up here. So I don't shy away from awkward topics or theologically rich topics, but I will try to define terms that I throw out uh, that I might not expect everyone to know. Like I just used repentance earlier, and I defined what that meant. If I throw out a term like sanctification, I won't just let that sit and expect that that's going to mean the same thing to everyone here. I'm going to throw that out and then explain. Well, sanctification is just a big word for the process of becoming more like Jesus. And so I got pretty good at that speaking at Alpha classes in D.C. where you're in a whole room full of people that know virtually nothing about Christianity. And it's like, okay, like anything you throw out, it's even remotely Christianese, you have to define. And so I explained everything. There's this website online that has this forum where it's, uh, the thread's called like, Explain Like I'm Five. And maybe I'm just not a bright guy, but that's really helpful to me. <laughs> Whenever I want something, want to figure something out. And so in the messages, we'll look at what Scripture has to say about something, about what it has to teach, but then we'll also look at how to apply that. An old professor of mine used to say so often, his question was always, so what? Read a passage of Scripture and ask, so what? What does this passage want me to think? What does this passage want me to do? What does this passage want me to believe? And we'll look at all of Scripture. Jesus doesn't tell the disciples and teach them the stuff that's pretty easy for them to do. Teach them the stuff that comes naturally. Teach them the stuff that doesn't really shake things up too much, but just kind of, you know, it hits them right where they're at. No, Jesus is teaching them everything, all, all the things that I have commanded. And so there's no better example of this than the walk through Matthew. That we're doing, where we're looking at everything he said, we're digging deep. Uh, last week we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's worth going back to again. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So all Scripture is useful for teaching and training. And so we're going to look at it all, not just the stuff that's convenient or easy or fun. Another thing that we do that I think helps make disciples on Sunday morning is folks serving on ministry teams. That serving on a team, it's a great way to get stretched. It's a great way to learn and to grow in your faith. And so I'd love to see every Lakesider at some point be involved in a ministry team. Small groups are, of course, a big part of our design for making disciples here. It's an opportunity for that teaching to be a little more hands-on. You can have more of a dialogue that way. You can bounce things off of each other. It's valuable for those reasons. And so it's also an opportunity for you to help teach others. Because Jesus didn't just call me to train disciples. He didn't just call Gordy to train disciples. He called all of us to train disciples. All of his disciples are called to make more disciples. So it's everybody's responsibility to teach and to train each other. Small groups are a great opportunity to do that, to be able to rub shoulders with folks, to have some iron sharpens iron sort of time. Uh, It's a fantastic way for you to get involved helping other people be better disciples. If you're not active in a small group, man, you're missing out. We got our next semester starting in September. And so we'll have, you know, the guides and all that coming out uh, as that gets closer. Man, get plugged in. Get involved. You'll be blessed for it, and you're going to be able to then bless other people as well. It's the most win-win thing that we do here at Lakeside. We also have a mentoring ministry. If you want to be on the giving or receiving end of one-on-one teaching and training, mentoring is a great opportunity for that. And honestly, a lot of our ministry teams here at Lakeside follow under this idea. Men's ministry. It's about making disciples out of men. 
Women's ministry, but making disciples out of women. Kids and youth, making disciples of kids, starting them at an early age so that they become strong adult disciples. Our wellness ministry that we've just officially started recently. It's about teaching disciples in regards to our health. When we take care of ourselves physically, we're better disciples. Uh, Our cancer care ministry, that's new. It's about making disciples with those who are walking through their toughest times. The goals of these sorts of programs and teams are to help Christians grow in their faith and to grow in obedience to Jesus. That's our job as a church. Now, I've heard a lot of messages on the Great Commission in my life. Uh, I don't know how many, but I'd probably say a lot. Uh, (laughs) And it always sort of hits me as this like really heavy (laughs) command from Jesus. Like, you just read this, this can be daunting at times. Like, ooh, man, we gotta we gotta do this. This is tough. But for some reason, until I started doing prep for this message, I don't remember hearing many people talk about the verses that surround the command part of it. Because the passage that we read here, it doesn't start with a command. It starts with a promise. This is sort of a command sandwich with promised bread, what Jesus says here. Because Jesus starts the command, go therefore. Anytime we see a therefore in the Bible, we should ask one question. What is it there for? And so he's pointing back to the promise before the command. In light of this, do this. And so the first promise he gives is he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much authority? All of it. Now, authority is a word here that means influence or power. It gets used in the political and legal spheres in Jesus' day. So Jesus is saying, this is right after the resurrection, he's saying, I'm in control. I'm running things now in heaven and on earth. All the power, all the authority, it's mine. Nothing stands in his way. So if he's in control of everything on heaven, of everything on earth, then we can do this. We can answer this commission because he's the one controlling everything. Remember, we're just planting or watering. It's Jesus that's producing the harvest. It's Jesus that's doing the rescuing. So that makes our jobs a whole lot easier and a whole lot less scary, if you ask me. The pressure's off. Jesus has all the power. He's got all the authority. So what do we have to worry about? He's supreme. It's his responsibility. Jesus is just as invested in the Great Commission as we are. I think sometimes we think about this like, oh, he gave the Great Commission, then he was just like, deuces, I'm going to go take a nap. Like, (laughs) that's not what he does here. He is just as invested in this being fulfilled as we are. And he's in control. The second promise is even better. It comes after the command. It starts with, behold. Behold, it's this word, edu. So basically, it's an interjection, which is why most Bibles don't even like, translate that. They just kind of leave it out like it's superfluous. But it's not. It's this interjection that means, like, look, or watch out. If you've ever heard a preacher say something like, you know, and watch what happens next here, which if you've come to this church for any amount of time, you've probably heard me say this. That's the idea this little word gets across. And so first it was therefore. Because of this promise, here's the commission. Then on the back end, it's like, and watch. Because of this commission, watch what happens here. And what a promise it is. Jesus says he will be with us always until the very end of the age. Until history is wrapped up, until everything is finished, he is with us. How does Matthew's Gospel start? Well, the genealogy. But after the genealogy, it starts with his birth story, right? Where he gets this name, Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. So Matthew starts, Jesus is God with us. And he ends with Jesus going, and I will be with you. I am with you now and will be with you forever. So there's no break, there's no gap in that. I'm with you forever until history is tied in a bow. And so he's always with us. That means you will never be in a situation where Jesus is not present. It's not possible. 
David writes in Psalm 139, there's nowhere that you can go to escape him. Which on one hand, you might read that and think that's a little uh, intimidating, like I'm watching you, <laughs> you can't go anywhere. But that's not the, the point here. The point is that we've been given this mission and Jesus is going to help us accomplish it. He's going to be with us through it forever. We've not been given a mission and then just left a twist in the wind. We've been given a mission that Jesus is not only in control of, he's going with. And so we do baby dedications here at Lakeside. And the parents in the congregation, they respond to these calls to raise the child to know the Lord uh, with a very specific phrase. It's always, with God's help, we will. And when I think about the Great Commission, when I think about our mission as a church, our mission to make disciples, it seems huge. It seems daunting at times. We're all called to do this as individuals and collectively as a church. Sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes it feels like a thankless task. Sometimes it's really uncomfortable. But we can never forget that our answer to this call will never be anything other than with God's help, we will. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you have entrusted great responsibility to us, that you think enough of us, that you give us this opportunity to be a part of your mission here on earth. I pray that you would give us courage as we go out of here, as we are walking through our day-to-day, -day, that the openings that you show us, that we would use them well, that we would not be afraid or intimidated to share who you are and what you've done with others. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom to be able to recognize windows of opportunity, doors that you've opened, that we would see those and make good use of them. Lord, and most of all, we thank you that you have not sent us out alone, but that you are with us and always will be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.